Chapter 6, Section 2, Polynomials and Linear Factors. What we're going to learn in this lesson is we're going to learn to analyze the factored form of a polynomial. We're going to learn to write polynomial functions from its zeros. And words we're going to touch base on, relative maximum minimum, the factor theorem, multiple zeros, and multiplicity. Okay? The factored form of a polynomial. Just as you can rewrite a whole number as its products of its prime factors, look at example 6, we can break that down to 2 and 3, we can break down a polynomial to its linear factors. Remember we did this. Alright, once a polynomial has been factored completely to its linear factors, it's considered in factored form. Okay, write polynomial state in standard form. So write the expression x plus 1, x plus 2, x plus 3 in standard form. So this is a factored polynomial right now, and now it says we want to write it in standard form. What I do is I draw a line, and I pull two apart. Now we're just going to go ahead and distribute or FOIL. So the first term, x times x, is x squared. x times 3 is 3x. Okay, no more, no more terms in the second one. So we go to the second term of the first grouping. 2 times x is 2x. And then 2 times, six is, or 2 times 3 is 6. Now we're going to sum like terms. So we're going to get x squared plus 3x plus 2x is 5x plus 6. Okay, and now we're going to multiply it by x plus 1. We're just going to drop that down. Now, first term to first term, so x times x squared is x cubed. x times 5x is 5x squared. And x times 6 is 6x. Okay, now we're going to go to the second part. Second term first one. So 1 times x squared is x squared. 1 times 5x is 5x. And 1 times 6 is 6. So now we're going to sum like terms. Okay, x cubed, it's by itself, so x cubed. 5x squared and x squared. So that's going to be 6x squared. We have positive 6x and a positive 5x, so that's going to be 11x. And then the 6 is by itself. So there we go. We've put this in standard form. All right, it's a cubic because the highest term is third degree, polynomial four terms. And I'm just putting that out there just so you can see how it all ties in together. So. That is the standard form, and the factor form was what was given to us, x plus 1, x plus 2, and x plus 3. Okay? So write an expression of x plus 1, x plus 1, and x plus 2 as a polynomial. Okay? So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite it. x plus 2, and again, you can do it either way you want, x plus 1, x plus 1. If you remember the shortcut, you could go ahead and write this since it's a plus b squared. But if you don't remember it, it's no big deal. Just go ahead and fold. x times x is x squared. x times 1 is x. 1 times x is x. And 1 times 1 is 1. So we can rewrite that as x squared plus 2x plus 1. Okay, so we've distributed that. Don't forget to drop down the last term. Now let's distribute this one. x times x squared is x cubed. x times 2x is positive 2x squared. And x times 1 is x. 2 times x squared. 2x squared. 2 times 2x is 4x, and 2 times 1 is 2. Sum like terms. 
x cubed. So I have an x squared and a 2x squared and a 2x squared, so that's going to be 4x squared. Then I have an x and a 4x, that's going to be 5x. And then 2 is by itself. So I have x cubed plus 4x squared plus 5x plus 2, so the answer is D. All right. Writing a polynomial in factored form. So write 2 x cubed plus 10x squared plus 12x in factored form. So we got 2x cubed plus 10x squared plus 12x. First thing we're going to do is factor out the GCF, the greatest common factor. Each term right here has a 2 and an x. So let's factor out a 2x. Let's rewrite it. So this is going to be x squared plus 5x plus 6. So can we factor x squared plus 5x plus 6? Let's check. What's our a times c value? 6. What's our b value? 5. What are two numbers that have a product of 6 and a sum of 5? Well, 3 and 2. So I could rewrite this as 2x times x plus 3 times x plus 2. Okay, so that is factored form. That is our answer. Okay, write the next example. 3x cubed minus 3x squared minus 36x. Okay, each term has a 3 and an x in it. So I can rewrite this as x squared minus x minus 12. So we can do our x factor. A product of negative 12 and a sum of negative 1. Well, negative 4 and positive 3. So I could rewrite this as 3x times x minus 4 times x plus 3. And that is my answer in factored form. And the answer would be A. Okay? So real world connection. Several popular models of the carry-on luggage have a length 10 times greater, 10 inches greater than their depth. To comply with airline regulations, the sum of the length, the width, and the depth may not exceed 40. So the length and be 10 inches more than the depth. The depth will just make the depth. And the width has to be 40 minus the sum of the length and the depth. So the width could be rewritten as 40 minus 10 minus 2D, which the width could be simplified to 30 minus 2d. So the volume would be the length times the depth times the width. So the volume would be 10 plus d, which is the length. The depth is just d, and the width is 30 minus 2d. Okay. So find the x-intercepts. Well, the x-intercepts are where d can equal 0. So d would equal 0 at negative 10, 0, and 15. So the depth at negative 10, which we can't have a depth of negative 10, 0, which we can't have a depth of 0, and 15. So a good depth would be 15 inches. That would make the length 25 inches. All right, and that'd make the width zero. So those are our zeros. What is the maximum possible volume of a piece of luggage? What are the corresponding dimensions of the luggage? Again, we know these are the zeros at negative 10, 0, and 15. So if we were going to graph this, it would look something like this. Here's your x, y, there's 0 on the x, there's negative 10, and there's 15. So if we graph this, it would look something like this. 
So our maximum would be right here, which would give us about seven and a half or eight inches. And since right now we're not using the graphic calculator to solve this, we can just estimate about eight and we can plug eight in for uh, the depth and then figure out the width and the length and then come up with dimensions and the volume. Okay, next. And again, that's the graph right there. And you see that's about the relative maximum, the relative minimum. Obviously, all these can't happen. Anything on this side can't happen. You can't have any negatives. So it kind of shows you where the volume is going to fall or where the depth is going to be. All right, and then don't forget the x-intercepts of the graph of the function are called zeros because that value of the function is zero at these x-intercepts, okay? That's it for the first part of chapter 6.2.